Hi, I'm Jessica from Tudor Time Machine, and I want to thank a brilliant listener who surprisingly is on Twitter, and that's the 16th century king of France, Francois Roy, who let us know that we made an error. His second wife, Queen Eleanor, was not born in Spain, as we stated in our previous episode, but born in Flanders, or, in other words, the Low Countries. So thank you, Francois Roy. We love our Tudor Wise listeners. Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 41 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. And we love our thousands of Tudor minded listeners from all over the world. It's so exciting for us to have you here. We've had such a great time researching and imagining this project. And sharing it with everyone. And if you're enjoying it, support us. Buy some great Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the Shop Now button and you'll see all the wonderful items we have for sale. Get your great Do You Tudor tea or a sweatshirt and support the podcast at the same time. In our last episode, it was Valentine's Day and love was in the air. But in this chapter... Aunt Stoner has come to town with some serious advice for Constance. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 41, Savoy House, the home of Sir Henry and Lady Lee, in which Constance visits with Aunt Stoner and receives a gift from her betrothed. The double door swung open. The snow whipped into the hall, and the servants dragged Constance and Wynne in by their cloaks, slamming the doors behind them. They curtsied before Constance, her vizard and red cloak obscuring her rank. She could be the queen, unlikely, as only one servant followed her, or the goldsmith's wife, come to collect her bill. The velvet mask obstructed her sideways view of the room, so she spun around in a circle to check if the odious Sir Henry was about. The servants followed suit, a strange moment. Ascertaining that he was not in the room, she spat the bead that held her mask in place and dropped it in her hands. And there, in plain sight, he walked in and posed beside an outlandish cabinet, a new addition to his collection. Mistress Constance, do you know what I like best about a woman wearing a vizard? He was so slimy, Constance thought. He must have been hours at his grooming, his doublet padded for shoulders, his legs for calves, and his hair was huge, as if a cat had gotten into it. La, had Sir Henry sham hair? The color was close to his own, but she could see lighter strands woven in. Was he so dressed to impress her aunt? Or, God forbid, herself? She answered his leading compliment. Her cheeks are not red, her face is not frozen, she is warm, and you are gracious in your good thoughts of her. That is not it. I wonder what is beneath. A great face, or an ugly one, or the face of a thief. Constance wanted to roll her eyes. He was so theatrical. What would he do if his intended told him that God wanted him to have a chaste marriage? He would take leave of any sense. But what if his wife demanded humility or any virtue at all? He was prancing toward her, making heavy-lidded eyes and licking his lips, the bull taking stock of Europa. I, too, have stolen something, and yet its keeper gave it me. And he was misquoting Thomas Wyatt. Constance could not believe it. Would you give me the same? He asked, bearing down. Should she giggle? She saw ladies do that, but she found herself an unconvincing giddy girl. She decided to break into song. That had worked for Philomena once, and would announce her presence through the house. Oh, good sir, I too love Wyatt. And she raised her voice. My lute awake, perform the last labor that thou and I shall waste. It was effective. He hesitated, and she chirped. That is my aunt Stoner's favorite ditty. Unless Stoner House had undergone great changes, she was sure her aunt had no idea of a popular lyric. Sir Henry swaggered as he stood, offering the padding and wig as a final temptation. And yet it was not tempting, or perhaps as tempting as a grub if she were starving. No, he was not even that tempting. 
How you must long to see your aunt, he said, shrugging off her rebuff. You are kind, she said as she was ushered out. Sir Henry did not follow, loudly calling to his servants that he was expected by the Queen at Whitehall. Constance wondered if he had made overtures to her aunt. Aunt Stoner was perhaps his age. It came to Constance that Aunt Stoner was at the point in life of youthful vigor and mature mind. She must be attractive to men. Why did her widowed aunt not marry Sir Charles Paget? For temperament and belief they were well suited. Constance had thought of her guardian as old when she lived at Stoner House, but, among the many ladies of her recent acquaintance, her aunt was a perfected example of a woman, and still had her own hair, unlike Sir Henry. Through the doorway she saw her aunt's familiar face beside that of Charles's mother, Lady Paget, the proud grand dame who had Henry Lee's heir in her lap. Her aunt rose and took Constance in her embrace. Charles's mother, after exclamations over the cold weather and calls for a warm drink for Constance, took up the baby and left the Stoner women to visit. Retreating to a corner bench, Constance passed an hour together with her aunt, as her guardian happily conjured Constance's possible future, a celebration at the obdurate Queen's wedding blessing, a tally of the number of children to be born, a position as an ambassador for Charles to France or Spain, or even to Rome, somewhere where his religion would be celebrated, a life well-planned, full of fortune, and avoiding accidental death, poor timing, and traitorous acquaintance. Constance thought Aunt Stoner had not lived such a life, nor would she, nor would the Queen herself. Aunt Stoner concluded, My throat is worn from the many words that have flown through it, and yet you say nothing. I hear your marvels, and I wish they were to be mine. They are to be yours, Constance. What have we been gibble-gabbling after all this time? Why should they not be? show yourself the kindest of guardians to think this future mine to have, but it shall not come to pass. My intended does not wish it. Constance was at the very least not responsible for Charles's desire to remain chaste. She gave herself that gift, but she must try to write a line of her own fate. If she appealed humbly, her aunt might release her. Oh, dearest girl, why say you so? His family approves the match. The Pagets could not be more anxious for your comfort. And the moment my slipper set upon the floor of the hall, Sir Charles assaulted me with his speeches, which, and I do not increase, were solely of you. At your name he flushes, he smiles, his heart is sweet. Any woman would find Sir Charles Paget a better view than a sunset on the Thames. But your little face is crumpled like a pug. Why do you look so? Constance shifted closer and bowed her head. Aunt, he does not wish our marriage to be consummated. Her aunt's face filled with sadness. In a moaning voice that Constance knew as her most disapproving, she said, what have you done, my girl? Why would such a subject be broached? You did not think to win him with your flesh. Oh, misguided youth, child, he does not seek you now before you are wedded. He is truly pious, as I have brought you up to be. Oh, Constance, is there a gentlewoman who does not wait until there is God in her holy union? Is there a gentlewoman who does, countered Constance in her mind, yet guardians must roll God's thunder into youthful loins, hoping to limit swelling bellies. Constance answered the accusation. Madam, I would never bring you shame. I am chaste. You need not fear. Charles plans his life to be a thing outside the usual, and he has confided it all to me. Aunt Stoner smiled gently. He does not want to give up a mistress. Oh, it is hard, but such is the way of men. You will turn happy for his visit to another bed. Desire is unhealthful when you are expectant of a child. Constance took this mention of children to make her case. Dear aunt, I shall never have a child. Charles does not wish us to marry, but as a cover for a celibate life as monk and nun. We are to find a brotherhood of... I cannot now remember, when he told me he was in such a way so passionate, I believe it to be in Spain. Silently she added, and it is so very strange and terrible and not to be wished for. 
What a devout man, breathed Aunt Stoner. What a beautiful soul. Oh, I could not have the strength, but you, Constance, I believe that you could. You have shown such fearlessness in your visits to my unfortunate friend in the tower, as I knew you should. I have seen the unexpected wings of the angels on your back as you walked in the garden at Stoner. I have tried to make a place for you in this world, but Charles's path I believe to be the path of the godly. Constance quickly summed the years between her aunt and Charles perhaps less than a dozen. Her aunt could enjoy the chaste life, and she herself could marry some fellow with a little lust in his heart. Dearest aunt, you see the path more clearly than I. I could only cry Alleluia should you renounce the world. Her aunt clasped her hands together. I am not good enough. I am not made of the fine stuff that weaves together Constance Donna. Why, wondered Constance, did everyone insist on her goodness? To make her pliant? To console her boredom? To shove responsibility on her? Her aunt would not be baited by an insinuation that she herself should marry Charles. Yet her aunt did understand that approval from the Queen must be gained. A marriage the Queen would bless might please her. You see me through your own virtuous eye, madam, and honour me beyond my own worth, dear aunt. How can I deserve your graciousness for setting me here at court, and the arrangement with Charles? How fortunate! Carpe diem, Constance thought, and ploughed ahead. But what if there were another man who cared to marry me? A man who could have the Queen's approbation? Her aunt crossed herself, putting her face close enough for their noses to touch. Aunt Stoner said with a strained, patient tone, Charles Paget has the prior claim, dear girl, that shall be respected, yet the fact that you should draw favour from one or more men only impress me more. I remember your quiet ways. It was lack of company and not lack of conversation that had held her silent with men, thought Constance. Oh, aunt, he would be a good match for me. Young Herbert, the Earl of Pembroke's second son. Aunt Stoner shuddered, her lips puckered. Constance, Constance, the Earl of Pembroke is no friend to our family. It strikes at my heart that you could find sympathy with his son. Her venture had not produced any good results. Constance would not be marrying a man who desired children. She might as well try to ward off the guilted shame. Madam, I did not seek Herbert's attention. If you have accepted his advances, it is all one. It is hard, so very hard. Her aunt made that dreaded moan again. Madam, please, Constance begged. I was led to think of him. It was not my own choice. Aunt, I swear it. Lady Clinton encouraged it, with the sufferance of Lady Mildred Cecil. Aunt Stoner's voice was sharp cutting. What a sad. You must turn your ear from such great heretics, from such serpents, Constance. They are evil and shall burn in hell for ever. Their torment will go on for eternity, eternity, my child. Do you desire to give ear to harlots who will be in hell for eternity? No, my aunt, I do not. Constance felt so uncomfortable when her aunt talked about who would be in hell and their suffering. Constance feared for their immortal souls, but not very often. The Queen listened a great deal to Lady Clinton, and Lady Mildred Cecil was formidable. Constance thought herself fortunate to have drawn their interest. You have been at court too long, Constance. Charles Paget is the one. There is no other. You cannot tie yourself to a man bound for the devil's lair. Constance thought of herself looking down far down from heaven, and seeing poor Herbert naked and flailing about in a boiling cauldron. That would be sad, but in life she believed she would prefer him as a husband, and she need not change her own religion for him. She was good at keeping secrets. She would not be cowed by her aunt. She knew about sin. But is it not a sin to remain childless, aunt? In this case, I think not. I believe God will see your sacrifice and be merciful. Beaten. Constance knew it, yet she struggled on. And yet, was it not a bit of a mischief, Sir Charles never mentioning his desire to be a monk? The damnation of virtually everyone Constance knew had set everything right again in her aunt's mind, and she said with great good humour, You make me laugh, dear girl. He honours you by telling you his truest desires. What if he married you and then had revealed his holiness? 
See how he wishes you to join him in his life. I can hear the wings of the angels beating about me. Oh, said Constance, I suppose I have a cold and my ears are clogged. Aunt Stoner embraced her in a hug that brought no comfort. I must tell you a truth, Constance, that I have kept hidden in my heart. Your mother never wanted you to be told. Bess believed in the silence of the soul. Her great strength broke her health. Her aunt sighed. Your mother was once a nun, a Cluniac nun, at the Delapre Abbey. What brides of Christ they were! How humble, devout! And your mother Bess, as gentle as a dove. The destruction of the Abbey, the looting of all the holy things, I cannot tell you the rippling despair that was left in the wake. Those soldiers, they tore up the psalters and hung the pages outside the jakes to be used to wipe themselves. They shall burn in infamy. That I can cling to. They shall burn. Why did King Henry do this thing? Why did he ruin this beautiful thing in our lives and struggle to wrest God from our praying hands? Oh, Lady Aunt, how the people suffered, Constance said. That witch queen, Anne Boleyn. Constance, she was a Protestant devil. It is true, and it is true that she drove the king. But once Satan takes hold, it is hard to loose his grasp. The beheading of the whore Anne stopped nothing. King Henry went on and on, killing and burning. Aunt Stoner's voice choked. The most terrible of all sacrileges. The destruction of St. Thomas Becket's shrine. The smashing of the tomb. Constance shuddered at the thought of how Beckett's holy bones were stuffed into a cannon and blasted into the air, the ashes scattered across the fields of Canterbury. Her aunt went on. The monks, put out of their abbeys, wandered, but many found a way to teach or work. They survived. Our sweet sisters, there was no mercy for our sisters. What was left for them? They believed in their vow, their chastity. How could they abandon their true nature? They lost a place to live. Most drifted. But your mother, at your grandmother's behest, came to live at Stoner. And your father found he loved her, her mercy, her kindness. What a soul Bess had. Your father took her as his wife. Bess cried for her virginity as you cry now. This is the order of things. You, Constance, shall live out your mother's vow as she could not. Constance was silent, her reasoned objections to a life with Charles, utterly crushed by the weight of family. Lady Paget returned at that moment on the arm of her son, a conflagration of internal shame, hair admiration, and desire for flight whipped through Constance as she gazed with a beneficent smile at Charles. She had not seen him since his launch through her window at Bedford House. She had considered him so often since then that his bodily presence made her dizzy. His dimple quivered in his cheek. What could she make of that? Was his mind as separated from the moment as her own? The two of you, too overcome to speak, Charles's mother exclaimed. Lady Stoner, come sit over by the fire. A servant placed two chairs close to the hearth. The older lady opened a prayer book, and her aunt played along with Lady Paget's fear of young love unchecked. Charles pulled Constance to a window at the other side of the room. She wanted to ask why, as both their chaperones knew of their marriage. Horrors! He touched the hair near her forehead and pulled at a curl. No doubt he had read that this was an effective courting act. His faux sincerity chilled her. A man like this, what was in his soul? My sweet, I have made preparations. By Holy Week we will be bound, Charles murmured. Constance opened and closed her mouth like a fish. He sighed. It has been many nights since I gazed on you, sweet Constance. She knew he was a false lover, and yet a bit of her swayed. Perhaps he cared about her, found the baby hair on her hairline charming. Now, now, my boy, you must keep your hands to yourself, Lady Paget chided her son with a grin. But she is so lovely, Charles touched Constance's eyelash with his thumb and smiled softly. He was a dung heap, Constance reminded herself. That fateful night he had done nothing but force on her a life of childlessness and gabble about his own worth. I too have thought of you so often, she lied. And I of you. I have brought you a gift. Your generosity, sir, is without measure. 
Desperation seized her. These lies would be the whole of her life. Perhaps she could encourage Charles to take a vow of silence. Their frigid marriage would at least be quiet. The ladies behind her clucked as he opened a wardrobe and removed a largish object hidden beneath a velvet drape. The proffered gift was the likeness of a monk. Standing from the floor, it reached almost to Constance's knee. A horsehair tonsure, a black tunic, a benign expression, and carrying a little wooden rosary. This monk was the most disturbing object she had ever laid eyes on. Human, yet stiff wood. Not something for a lady, but something foreign. Of all things, why would he present her this oddity? She said, How strange and beautiful. Curiosity brought the other ladies to Constance's side. Charles took out a small key and placed it at the base and twisted. Set down, the homunculus began rolling along the floor. Constance recoiled as the possessed object lifted its rosary. Why does it move of its own accord? she said. Charles, Charles, what is it? Oh, fetch a priest. It is a demon. Lady Paget shrieked and covered her face. Stop, mother. It is no demon. Why did you bring this here? What purpose has it? It is awful from the workshop of the devil, Lady Paget said through her hand. Aunt Stoner was hanging back, arms crossed tightly over her chest, eyes wary. Constance thought the thing a rotten gift, but it would not bring her to an apoplexy. Mother, soothed Charles, our miniature monk was blessed by the Pope himself. Lady Paget asked, by, by the late Pope Pius, God rest his soul, or our present Pope Pius, may he live long in God's glory. That is of no importance, Charles insisted. It was blessed by a pope. Either the new pope, may God protect him, or the old pope, God rest his soul. And this machine, mother, is no demon. It is a wonder, made by one of the faithful, for the glory of God. Lady Paget quieted. Oh, Constance, intoned her aunt, that is something wondrous. When you are not able to attend mass, it shall be as if you have your own monk. She would have her own monk in any case, thought Constance. Why would she need an extra one? Her aunt's eyes were watery, and her smile enormous. Jesu, did this woman see this object as a harbinger of good fortune? The monk rolled its eyes, the moving jaw mouthed prayers. Were she and Charles to live in a house with no children, but animated by wooden monks? She could not even imagine such a thing. She would kick them every day. She would hide the keys so they might wind down. What would this man produce next? A puppet of a headless St. Catherine bleeding milk? Sir, you love this rare invention so profoundly. I cannot take it from you. You must keep it for yourself, she suggested. Oh, what a cord you shall have, squeaked Lady Paget. Dear friend, see how your niece thinks of my son. This little monk is a wonder, Charles, but you can see why I thought it was a demon. And with that, she slipped her arm through Aunt Stoner's, and they returned to their corner. Constance watched the mechanical praying and crossing begin to wind down. The slowed motion imbued the action with a kind of longing. It was a trickery, Constance thought. It was not a plaything brought to life with imaginings. It was almost between something alive and something made by man. She spoke up. I think the maker of this object has hubris. I believe God should be God. A man cannot make a man. Constance, I am in amazement. Do you question that which the Pope has approved? A sharp voice, Constance noted. Is this how devout Charles would speak to her once the marriage was done? She wanted to be humble. She should say, forgive me. But instead, she simply said, I honour the Pope. I am a true Catholic. But, dearest, do you have a bit of the sin of pride? She was furious. She wanted to hit the horrible thing. And then it came to her that it was not the miniature monk, but Charles she wanted to kick. The image of her shoes flying at his shins and him bouncing up and down in pain brought warmth to her heart. Forgive me, sir, she bowed her head, looking at her feet. What affection she had for them. You love this monk so much, you must take it with you. Will we not have it to share, he said smoothly. Oh, indeed, but you must keep it. I am but a clumsy girl. What if I were to break this curiosity? I would have to lash myself. Do you practice flagellation? You exceed my expectations. This Charles was not one to speak in an exaggerated way. He was exaggeration itself. She cursed herself. What had she begun with the most off-handed words? But to her relief, he continued, You have not the need for the scourge, one as pure as you are. Yet, dear sir, you must keep the machine for me, Constance insisted. It will not go well for me if it is discovered in my possession. 
It is true, Charles said, but take comfort, my dear. Soon we will be with the Brotherhood, among those who are in sympathy with us. St. Fryswide, Constance had read in the Golden Legend, had escaped her own marriage fate. It was not sinful to wish a woman's life. It was only sinful to be an unwilling nun. If she prayed fervently, the saint might release her from Charles. He did not need to be struck blind, just a change of heart. He could go off and be celibate. And if Protestant Herbert was not to the saint's liking, some other, any other, a poor fellow, an old one, he did not need to be English. He could be Italian, French, even Irish. Aunt Stoner is putting quite the guilt trip mm. on Constance. The English Catholic community has been through a lot in the past 30 years. Yeah, she has a lot of ammunition. And here we go again, the religious situation in England under the Tudors. Well, we've talked about it a lot because it's such an important backdrop to our story. Quick review. Henry's final break with Rome came in 1533 when he married Anne Boleyn and he was excommunicated. That break came after seven years of trying to get an annulment from Catherine. In 1530, Henry got rid of Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, who he accused of being in league with Rome and intentionally holding up negotiations. Then, with the support of his counselor, Thomas Cromwell, and his new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, everyone was named Thomas, Henry went his own way and set himself up as the supreme head of the English church. But he did not become a Protestant ever. In fact, he continued to persecute Protestants and to ban Protestant tracts. I think one of the reasons why Henry didn't ultimately become a Protestant was because Martin Luther agreed with the Pope. He didn't consider Henry's annulment from Catherine valid. Who knows? Henry might have become a Protestant if Luther approved. Uh, basically, Henry considered himself a Catholic king who did not recognize the Pope's authority. And in 1534, the Acts of Supremacy were passed, making Henry and all subsequent rulers of England the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England, and that the crown shall enjoy all honors, dignities, preeminences, jurisdictions, privileges, authorities, immunities, profits, and commodities to the said dignity as the head of the English Church. Honors, commodities, and profits. A few of Henry's favorite things. <laughs> yes, and immunities. Those come in handy. After the Acts of Supremacy, the Treason Act was passed, which made it treason to disavow the Acts of Supremacy. And that was actually what led to the death of another famous Thomas, Sir Thomas More. More was against the annulment from Catherine and against the break with Rome. But the fact that he would not recognize Henry as the head of the church lost him his head. Henry is left with his religious reformer wife, Anne Boleyn, who may or may not have been a full-fledged Protestant, a reformist Archbishop of Canterbury, who later, in the reign of Edward, proved himself to be an ardent Protestant, and his chief minister, Cromwell, who some historians consider a religious reformer, some say was a Protestant, and some say was essentially an agnostic. From the moment the Acts of Supremacy were passed in 1534, Cromwell and Henry began looking to take wealth from the English churches and monasteries that had been under the guidance of Rome and pass that wealth to Henry. So wanting to make a second marriage to Anne Boleyn, yes, it was the catalyst for Henry's break with Rome. But some of the most violent and destructive and extreme episodes of the English Reformation happened after Anne had been executed. The sort of thumbnail version of events holds that Anne is the reason for Henry's break with Rome. But it's not as if when he had his marriage to her declared invalid and basically implied she cast a spell on him for nine years <laughs> and had her executed. And it's a pretty... <laughs> that after that, he ran back to the Pope and said, Mia culpa. I want to get back in your good graces. Yes, and if he had done that, the Pope would have taken him back because the Vatican needed all the support and loyalty it could get. Religious upheaval was spreading all across Europe, and the Pope was extremely nervous. The father of our own Princess Cecilia, King Gustav Vasa, broke away from the Pope in 1527. We're focusing on the English Reformation because it's the backdrop of our story, but many European leaders wanted to free themselves from Rome's authority. Well, being subject to the Pope limited the power of a nation's monarch, and monarchs don't like that. 
I mean, we see that in history all the time, right? And there were also tremendous financial advantages to cutting out the Pope. Henry and Cromwell looked around and saw the wealth that was being moved from church to crown in other European countries. So after the execution of Anne, there was no reason to go backward. There were too many advantages for Henry being the head of his own church. In the hierarchy of Tudor society, only God was higher than Henry. That's heady stuff for a king. And before his break with Rome, the Pope was above him. And also Henry had support because many people were angry with Rome and with many of the church institutions because, I don't know, let's face it, let's be honest, there were egregious abuses going on, especially of the financial kind. The Pope was selling indulgences, which are sort of a get out of purgatory free (laughs) or or (laughs) or sooner card. And he was selling them and using that to advance the wealth of the Vatican and specifically to build St. Peter's Basilica. And Martin Luther suggested the building be funded out of the Vatican's already enormous wealth. And for that outrageous suggestion, he was excommunicated. Across Europe and and across England, many of the monasteries had enormous wealth that was kept within the monastery, not used to help the poor or for education as it was supposed to be used. Monks and nuns of those religious houses had a very pleasant lifestyle at the expense of the communities around them. Luther had a responsive audience with his calls for change. Luther called for monastic wealth to be redistributed to the poor and needy, to education and to charities. But of course, what happened is that with the Reformation, the wealth of the church in England did not go to those in need. It went to Henry. And then the same thing happened in other countries. The money went to the rulers. In fact, In many cases, the poor were actually worse off with the Reformation because even the insufficient charity given by the church and monastic institutions was gone. To begin this process of challenging monastic wealth, in 1535, Cromwell dispatched inspectors to travel throughout the realm and make an inventory of all the wealth and income held by the monasteries, the Valor Ecclesiasticus. At the same time, he dispatched other investigators to dig up dirt on monks and nuns who were violating rules of celibacy, being lax in their religious duties, and this was called the Comperta Monastica. But, of course, given Cromwell's agenda, it's unlikely that all the abuses listed took place. Sure. The Valor Ecclesiasticus was to whet Henry's appetite for goodies, and the Comperta Monastica was to make Henry feel better about dissolving these religious houses. Cromwell knew the abolishment of the monasteries was going to cause a lot of strife, and he wanted to make sure it was worth it. And it was. The Valor Ecclesiasticus showed that the monasteries, even though they were in decline from their heyday in the medieval period, were still worth over 360,000 pounds, which is more than 150 million pounds in modern money. And the church owned about 20% of the cultivated land in the kingdom. And it was also determined that monasteries gave only about 5% of their annual income to the poor. With the Valor Ecclesiasticus and the Comperta Monastica to build up support, especially with nobles who saw the potential of church wealth trickling down to them from the king, Cromwell introduced a bill in Parliament to reform the smaller religious houses. And that got voted down in favor of a bill introduced by the then Speaker of the House of Commons and a big Reformation supporter, Sir Thomas Audley. So Audley called to dissolve these smaller monastic houses instead of reforming them. Do you think that was the plan all along? I mean, Cromwell introduced a softer bill hoping to get a harsher bill passed. I think so. Cromwell had such a strong hold on things in 1536, and he was someone who could see the long game. But this passing of the bill led to the closing of some almost 400 religious houses, and monks and nuns had to be absorbed into bigger monasteries, or they just left the religious life altogether. And the king got a lot of top quality land out of 400 religious houses. In many places in the kingdom, there was not very much pushback, but in the north of England, tens of thousands of people rose up in what is known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. Which was the biggest domestic threat in the entire Mm. Tudor period, all the way from 1485 to Elizabeth's death in 1603. Their main demands were to keep the monasteries open, reestablish ties with the Pope, have Princess Mary made legitimate, and have Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, removed from his post. So Henry sent about 8,000 men from London to put down this rebellion. He negotiated peace, promised pardons, and then 
Once the people had dispersed and the danger was gone, Henry broke his word and had several hundred of the main instigators rounded up and executed. So much for the word of the king being sacred. Yep. And to further quash dissent, Henry also had some of the most resistant monks, those of the Cistercian Abbey in Sawley, hung for treason because they refused to sign the Act of Supremacy. And in 1539, Parliament passed an act to dissolve all the monasteries left in Henry's kingdom. Again, there just wasn't much the monks and nuns could do about it. No, they tried to hide their precious objects, including relics, in safe places. But anyone who resisted, like the abbots of Glastonbury, Woburn, Reading, and Colchester, they were executed. It's estimated that Henry reaped the modern equivalent of 500 million pounds from the closure of the monasteries. That is a lot of money. Well, all that cultivated land, all those abbeys to convert into royal houses. And all the precious jewels and gold to be stripped from religious objects. It all adds up. The shrine of St. Thomas a Becket at Canterbury Cathedral was one of the most important pilgrimage sites for Christians and the most important site in England. It was built between 1180 and 1220. And experts estimate that over 100,000 people visited it every year until it was destroyed in 1538 by Henry VIII. He had the shrine completely demolished. Much of it was gold and studded with jewels. Henry melted down the gold and repurposed the jewels to adorn his ever-expanding person. Many stories sprung up about the fate of Becket's bones. Some said that they were mixed in with other people's and buried. Some people said that they were incinerated. And we even found one story that said the ashes were put in a cannon and blasted out into the air. A monument always brings out big emotions. Sure, then is now. The intensity of feelings for or against a particular monument or a particular historical figure at a particular moment in history, it can be hard to relate to looking back. But it makes sense at the time to the people who are destroying the monument. Yes. It's interesting because experts on Canterbury Cathedral have recently made a CGI reproduction of what the shrine might have looked like. They used all the eyewitness accounts of some of the pilgrims who visited and wrote about it. And we'll post the article on the Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. It's spectacular, and it must have been quite a thing to behold. When you were talking about all the pilgrims that would come to the site, you know, these hundreds of thousands of people every year, it brought this sort of practical thought to my mind. I mean, what do you think the impact was on the town of Canterbury with the destruction of that shrine? Just the emotional impact, but the financial impact of losing the pilgrimage tourist industry. (laughs) It's a good question. 100,000 visitors to the town every year, and they all needed a place to sleep, a place to stable their horses. Places to eat, food carts, taverns, pie shops. And, you know, they had souvenirs even then. Sure. And, I mean, that would have been a devastating loss to the townspeople. Those kinds of ripple effects of a ruler's decision, they're really fascinating to consider. But Henry never gave the economic impact of the decline of the <laughs> tourist <laughs> trade in Canterbury a thought. He got his $500 million and blew through it pretty fast, spending it on failed wars and building projects. All this religious destruction and discovering that her mother was one of those nuns displaced by by Henry's action, that really weighs on Constance. She has to play nice to Charles Paget even when he makes her a romantic gift of a mechanical monk. <laughs> yes, we saw a video of a mechanical monk made in the 1560s that can still be wound up, and we had to put it in our story. We'll post the video on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page so you can see it. It's very, very creepy. And it really does move its mouth and creak along the floor, holding and lowering its prayer book. Let's give it credit. It is an incredible feat of machinery in the 16th century. But I think not the ideal gift for Constance. (laughs) No. But Charles Patchett sure thinks it's just what she would like. But next episode, we'll be moving away from religion and catching up with the occult doings of our favorite alchemy-loving princess. Join us next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk.